Hi, I'm Stephanie and this is my home, the 16th century Chateau de Lalande. Lalande was owned for hundreds of years by a family of marquises who were at the heart of French royal life. One of them even had the honour of being sent by King Louis XV to greet Marie Antoinette on her arrival in France. But, far from being a stuffy museum, this chateau is a living home. I live here all the time and I'm regularly joined by my mother, my family, my friends and wonderful volunteers from all over the world who help me to lovingly restore this historic home. Welcome to La Lande, a chateau filled with life, love and laughter. Hello and welcome to Sundays at the Chateau. I haven't made a proper Sundays at the Chateau since the beginning of lockdown because I've been trying to put out so many videos that I haven't had the time to really delve into the research for a particular topic. But for those of you who started watching my channel since lockdown, Sundays at the Chateau are where I used to just talk about one subject in depth anything to do with chateau life. So sometimes it would just be me talking about an aspect of our life here. For example, I did one about the monthly costs of running a chateau or how I came to buy the chateau in the first place. But sometimes I talk about European decorative arts. So I made one about Sèvres porcelain and another about Spode China in England. And this time I would like to do that again and talk to you about Toile de Jouy. It's such an iconic fabric. And I think it's impossible to think about French chateau without thinking about Toile de Jouy's because most chateaus in France will have at least one room that contains some of this fabric. Since their creation in the 18th century, decorators have been using Toile de Jouy to create incredibly romantic rooms, sometimes by just putting a little piece of the fabric to upholster an armchair, sometimes swathing the entire room in the same print so that the walls, the curtains, the bed, even the furniture are covered in exactly the same print. And that creates a French look that's recognizable all around the world today. And perhaps the most extraordinary thing about these fabrics is that they've never gone completely out of fashion. They were first created in the 18th century, continued to be fashionable in the 19th century, were still used in the 20th century, and are still used by designers today in the same way. That is quite an extraordinary achievement for any design. But even though the look is so iconic, there is still some confusion today about what it is that makes a Toile de Jouy a Toile de Jouy. Translated very simply, the name means cloth from Jouy. Toile is just a French word for cloth, and Jouy is a village near Paris called Jouy en Josas. So they're fabrics that were created in that factory between 1760 and its closure in the mid 19th century. But now we use the term to describe any fabric that is in the style of their most iconic designs, which were usually monochrome vignettes, wonderful pastoral scenes against a plain background. In fact, they designed many, many other types of fabric, as we'll see, but it's usually those specific types of prints, whether or not they were produced in Jouy, that we refer to when we say Toile de Jouy today. But I can't just delve in and tell you about the factory because in fact our story starts long before that, over a hundred years before its creation in the 16th century when the East India companies of England, France and Holland were starting to bring back exotic trade from Asia. Their ships were sent to buy spices for a European market hungry for exotic flavours. But whilst they were trading there, they also discovered wonderful printed cotton fabrics that they called Endienne because of their provenance from India. And these fabrics caused a sensation in the European market. Because although there already were printed cottons in Europe at the time, they weren't colour fast. You couldn't wash them. But the Indian cottons were printed in an ingenious way using mordants to fix the dye. A mordant is a type of fixative using metallic salts and depending on which mordant you use with which plant-based dye you use, you can create a different colour that stays completely colour fast. You can imagine the sensation that these fabrics caused in Europe at the time because not only were they beautiful, exotic, colourful designs, they were also practical, unlike the locally produced wool and silk fabrics. 
The traders who were bringing them back into Europe were also very quick in explaining to the producers exactly what they wanted for the European market. So they kept the exotic designs but added some more European flavour to them. Here you can see one of those original Indian textiles created for the European market because it was a panel for a skirt. So it's exactly the right shape to be made into a European skirt with a beautiful border going all the way along the bottom. They were so wildly popular that they were even mentioned in plays and literature of the time. And in Molière's play, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, Monsieur Jourdain says, I had this NDN made. My tailor tells me that people of quality dress this way in the mornings. And that tells us that the word NDN was no longer only describing the fabric, it was also describing the outfits that one was creating from the fabric. And they were usually soft, loose flowing dressing gowns that could be worn around the house. Those NDNs were described by other words in France too, sometimes Pékin for the French word for Peking, or Damas, or Perse, which is the French word for Persian. And the influence of those fabrics is still strongly felt in French chateaus today. For example, here at the Chateau de Lalande, we have kept all of the bedroom names that the previous family used for the rooms because they were here for over 200 years and I feel that that way there is a sense of continuation in history. And one of our room names is La Chambre Perse, many of you may know it. And that is because it has a wallpaper inspired by those very first Indien or Perse that were coming into the country. So that tradition had continued for over 200 years because we believe our room was decorated probably in the early to mid 20th century. The wallpaper there is by a firm that doesn't exist anymore, Paul Dumas et Compagnie. It's a beautiful, beautiful room. It's one of my favorite bedrooms in this chateau and it shows you just how relevant designs from nearly 400 years ago still are in French decorative schemes today. But the enormous success of the Indiens may have delighted the people of France, but it did not delight the owners of the silk and woolen manufactories or the governments that were making a great deal of money from the exportation of silk and wool to the rest of the world. They wanted to protect those industries at all costs, and to do so, France, quickly followed by England and Holland, banned the importation and the creation of printed cottons and they banned it for a very, very long time, on pain of imprisonment or exile. The ban came into existence through royal ordinance in 1686 and wasn't lifted in France until 1756. But in spite of the strict penalties, people were so desperate to get their hands on these fabrics that underground factories opened up in Europe and people were still illegally importing it. But once the ban was lifted in 1756, it became possible for people to create it in Europe openly. And in 1760, a Bavarian emigre to France, Christophe Philippe Oberkampf, opened his factory at Jouy en Josas near Paris. He chose that site for two main reasons. One, it was not too far from the court at Versailles, whom he was obviously hoping would become his biggest clientele. And two, it was near the Bièvre River, which was known for the purity of its water. And, as we'll see in a moment, creating printed toiles took an enormous amount of fresh water. Whilst today we think of Toile de Jouis as those pastoral vignettes of perfect French rural life, for the first 10 years, the factory at Jouy en Josas produced Indiennes in the same style as those that had been imported to France over 100 years earlier. They were printed using wooden blocks, they were multicolored, and they were extremely popular, and the factory at Jouy was able to expand rapidly. After 17 years of production in 1770, Oberkamp was able to add another method, plate printing. And this changed everything, because instead of using wooden blocks, plate printing used copper, and it meant that the engraving could be much more delicate, much finer. It allowed new complexity in the designs that they were producing there. And in fact, one copper plate could take up to six months to engrave. The copper plates were also larger than the wooden blocks, so the prints could get larger and more elaborate. And by 1783, Oberkampf's success was such that he was given the warrant of royal manufacturing. To commemorate that enormous achievement, Oberkampf employed a new artist who hadn't worked for him before, called Jean-Baptiste Huet. He asked him to design a toile showing the workings of the manufactory at Jouy-en-Josas. 
Yue was a painter who also produced cartoons for tapestries and those of you who saw my vlog from Paris and my visit to the Musée Camondo there may have seen this room. All of the paintings that you see on the walls of that room are cartoons that Yue produced for tapestries. But from that fateful first commission in 1783, though he may not have known it at the time, Uwe was destined to become the man responsible for some of the most famous Toile de Jouy designs that are still used today. That first design of Uwe for Oberkampf, the workings of the manufactory, has incredible historic importance today because it shows us how the prints were produced at the factory. This chateau places us because it's a Chateau de Jouy, so it immediately shows us which town we're in. Below and to the right of the chateau, you can see workers beating wet cloth. And that is because the new cloth had to be beaten to make it smooth and ready to take the mordant. To the right of that, we can see a block printer. And around him, there are fabrics drying and they're the ones that he's already printed. The block was put upside down onto the fabric and moved along it in sections. It must have been incredibly time consuming. Below them, you can see a plate printer operating the new copper plate printing press. This operated differently because the copper plate was laid face up and the fabric would be put down on top of it and then moved along. So you can see the fabric going up and over the system to hold it away from the press once it's been printed. Once the mordant had been applied, it would be soaked in a mm, delicious mixture of water and cow dung to remove the excess mordant. And that's what these women are working on in that barrel. After that, the fabric, which up to this point has been printed with the mordant, but not with the actual dye itself, would be put into a boiling bath of madder that would react with the mordant to fix a colour. And you can see that happening here with smoke coming out of the chimney where they have the fire to keep that bath bubbling. Different colours could be produced by varying which dyes you used and which mordants you used. Depending on the mordant used, dye produced from the root of the madder plant could produce pink, red, lavender, purple, black or brown whilst the plant dye weld could be used to create all forms of yellow. Indigo was applied separately, and because a true green wasn't developed until 1807, until that point, yellow and blue had to be layered to create green. And so this little vignette shows the women working in the factory painting on those colors. The women made their own paintbrushes using their own hair. Once the dye had been applied, it was time to remove the excess dye from the areas that hadn't been fixed with the mordant. And for that, the fabrics had to be washed over and over again. They would be laid out in the fields, you can see that in this vignette, where they would be doused in water seven or eight times a day for six days and in between allowed to bleach in the sun. The final stage of the process was calendaring the cloth. And for that, a mixture of wax and starch was applied to it and it was put through rollers to make it smooth. You can see that happening here. After that, some of the fabrics would also be polished with a smooth agate to give them a lustrous finish. And if you look closely in this twirl, you can even see Oberkampf, the owner of the factory himself, standing with his young son and just to the left of him, Hue, the artist, at his easel, sketching the scenes before him. I have to admit that until I researched this video, I had loved Toile de Jouise for the beauty of the designs, but I'd never spared a thought about the manufacturing process behind them. I just took their existence on this planet for granted. But now when I see an antique toile, I have profound respect, not only for the artist who made the beautiful designs, but for the inventors who made those processes possible so that these things could come into existence and for the patience and craftsmanship of the workers who had to toil for hours to make these beautiful finished products. After the huge success of this first twirl that he created for Oberkampf and which is still in production today through the French company Pierre Frey, Hue went on to work for the factory at jouy en josas until his death in 1811, producing many stunning designs for them. And those designs offer us a fascinating glimpse into the fashions and history at the time that they were produced. I would never have time to sit here and go through all of the more than 3,000 different fabric designs that were produced by the factory at jouy en josas but I will pick out a few of the more iconic ones that were designed by Jean-Baptiste Huet and show you how they were a perfect reflection of their times. 
The philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau was hugely influential in helping to bring about the Enlightenment in Europe, and his belief that man is innately good but corrupted by society led to a renewed fashion in all things natural and an idealised romantic view of the countryside. He described the possibility of finding a sufficient, complete and perfect happiness which leaves no emptiness to be filled in the soul. He went on to say, Such is the state which I often experienced on the island of Saint-Pierre in my solitary reveries, whether I lay in a boat and drifted where the water carried me, or sat by the shores of the stormy lake, or elsewhere, on the banks of a lovely river or a stream, murmuring over the stones. His philosophy led the groundwork for the movement towards Romanticism in France, and certainly influenced very fashionable women like Queen Marie Antoinette, who had her petit amour built, a little toy farm in which she could pretend that she was a dairymaid in the gardens of the Chateau de Versailles. The pastoral scenes that Uwe produced for Oberkamp reflect precisely that new fashion and this idealised view of countryside life. You can see it here in his The Four Seasons from 1789. In the spring there are people dancing around a maypole and gardening. In the summer they're harvesting, picnicking and fishing. In the autumn they're doing the vendange, picking the grapes for wine, and in winter they're ice skating and slaying in a magnificent horse-drawn sleigh. The same themes of the corruption of innocence when society imposes its rules can be seen in the novel Paul et Virginie. It was written by Jacques-Henri Bernardin de Saint-Pierre and first published in 1788, and it went on to be a huge success in France. Everybody was talking about it. It was made into operas and plays, and it was also made into a toile by Hue. The novel is set on the island of Mauritius, and the two main characters, Paul and Virginie, are two children who are brought up together by their mothers. You can see them in this part of the toile playing on their mother's laps. Their childhood is a paradise, but as they get older, they start to fall in love and society stands in the way. Seeing their love develop, Virginia's mother wants to keep her daughter away from Paul and wants to send her back to society in France. But her ship is caught in a storm and here you can see the shipwreck. Virginia chooses to remain on the sinking ship rather than to remove her clothes in front of the sailors to get into the water. So she chooses to die instead of sacrificing her purity. She drowns as Paul helplessly watches. And here you can see him sobbing over her corpse. And it doesn't show it on the twirl, but shortly afterwards, Paul dies of his own sorrow. And quickly after him, both of the mothers die of grief as well. So not the happiest of stories, but there was something about it that touched the hearts of everyone in 18th century France because they could not get enough of this story. And this twirl was a big success. And upstairs in our Toile de Jouy bedroom, if you follow me, I'm going to show you a Toile that is also based on the same story and that is still produced by Pierre Frey today. This is our Toile de Jouy bedroom at La Lande and I decided to fill it with lots of different Toiles because we're in the attic, we can be a bit less formal up here and I like this mixture. The wallpaper in here is not French, it's an English Toile, Vauxhall Gardens and I bought it at Lewis and Wood but that's not what I'm here to show you. I wanted to show you these curtains because until I researched this video, I always thought of them as a celebration of maternal love. There are two women holding their children up to look at each other. And these are from Pierre Frey. They're still available today, based on an 18th century toile from Normandy. But I now realize this is the first scene in the life of Paul et Virginie. There's no way that anybody in those days, when this was such a famous story, could have failed to recognise the two women, the two children growing up together as Paul and Virginie. Obviously it's a different style from the toile that we saw that was designed by Hue, but it's the same story. And it adds, I think, a layer of complexity to these curtains, because people in the day would have realised that not only is it celebrating maternal love, it's also celebrating young, innocent love between the two children, but it's a foreshadowing of romantic love and how that can go tragically wrong when society imposes itself. And then the loss of love and the grief that happens when you lose loved ones. All of that in this simple toile. Books, plays and operas continued to be a huge influence on the productions at Jouy. In fact, there was one made all about the marriage of Figaro and another one which I've discovered quite a lot about recently, purely by chance. 
This beautiful cushion was recently sent to me as a gift and there was no note with it. I have no idea who it was from, but I would like to thank you whoever you are because this sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole which uncovered some quite interesting things around the chateau. Because, although it came from Amazon, it's from a company called Maison d'Hermine and on the back it says that it's the Miller. And that reminded me that as I was reading the Toile de Jouy book, I read about one of Ua's designs called Le Meunier. And that was based on one of Aesop's fables. So when I saw that I had something called the Miller, I wondered if it was the same print. And when I went back to the book, I discovered that yes, indeed, this is a modern reproduction of Ua's Le Meunier, son fils, Elan, or rather the Miller, his son, and the donkey which is one of Aesop's fables. In France, Aesop's fables are known as Les Fables de la Fontaine because Fontaine translated them into French in the mid 1600s. Fontaine's version of the story is that the miller and his son are carrying their donkey tied onto a stick so that the meat will be fresh by the time they get him to market. Obviously passers-by seeing them do that are laughing at them. Why on earth are they carrying their donkey? So fine, they put the donkey the right way round and they start walking along with the donkey next to them and then people start laughing again. Why on earth are you walking next to your donkey rather than riding him? It makes no sense. So the father starts riding the donkey with the son walking alongside and then passers-by start to say, how could you leave your poor son to walk next to you and you're just riding the donkey? So they swap places and this time they hear people saying, you should be ashamed of yourself, young man, sitting on that donkey with your poor old father walking alongside you. And the moral of the story is that at the end, the miller says, you cannot please everyone no matter what you do. So you should simply get on and do what you want, not worry about what others have to say about it. This part of the vignette shows people just pointing and laughing at them because they don't approve of whatever it is that they happen to be doing with their donkey at that time. And then as I was researching all of this and reading about it, I remembered that last year I'd bought a piece of antique toile from Germany on eBay because I'm trying to build up a collection to frame lots of pieces of toile in this bedroom eventually. And I remembered I'd bought it because it had a donkey on it and my mother loves donkeys, but because I haven't got around framing everything yet, I just put it in my fabric cupboard. So I went to my fabric cupboard and lo and behold, it is the same design. It's Ues Le Meunier Son Fils Elan. And in this part of it, you can see people pointing again because the son is riding the donkey and his elderly father is walking along behind him. And they're berating him for treating his father that way. And I'm so excited to discover that I have a piece of this. I don't know how old this piece is, but it's just wonderful to know the history of it and the story behind it. So researching this vlog has absolutely enriched my understanding of things that were already in this chateau. The scale of these two prints is different, but this tree and branch are these, so it fits just here in the design. And then as if this wasn't enough excitement, I was thinking about a Christian Dior dress that I bought a very long time ago. I love buying vintage designer clothes secondhand and I was drawn to this one because anyone living in France would be drawn to this dress. It's made of toile de jouy. I'll get it to show it to you. Here it is and it was designed for Christian Dior by John Galliano back in the 90s and as you can see it's a wonderful toile de jouy and if you look carefully you'll see that it's exactly the same vignette as this one. So they've left the donkey out, but this is indeed the Miller by Jean-Baptiste Huet. So not only do I now have the cushion and an old fragment of fabric, I have a Christian Dior evening gown in the same pattern. And until I researched this video, I did not know any of these links. It's been such a joy. And I find that the more I look into this subject, the more fascinated I am by it. There, what do you think? I love that. Yeah, you like it? Yeah. It just shows that toile can be used for everything. It doesn't just have to be furnishings, wallpapers, curtains. I could just stand in the toile de jouy bedroom upstairs and I would just blend right in. Just, just a head floating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a summer party as soon as the weather gets nicer and we Let's can both that. dress up. Let's do that.
Okay, but now I'm going to put my other dress back on. <laughs> Most of the prints that I'm talking about today are still in production. Many modern companies have reproduced them. This one is obviously available as at least cushions through Maison d'Hermine, but I know that the wallpaper and fabric is also available through Schumacher. Travel was another huge influence on designs because travellers were starting to bring back tales of such exotic countries of Africa, Asia and America and Ue created a masterpiece in 1792 called The Four Corners of the World. Four continents are represented, Europe, America, Asia and Africa with little allegorical scenes. Europe, showing the total bias of the time, is a woman crowned, holding a scepter, showing her dominion over all of the continents. Africa has a woman wearing an elephant skull with children playing nearby. They're playing with snakes and with a lion. There's also a little ostrich in the background. Asia represents two women near incense with exotic fruit and spices. And America shows two Native Americans with beautiful headdresses, one of them with a bow and arrow and the other grappling a crocodile. Uwe so wanted to get the exotic animals right for this design that he spent a lot of time studying at the Natural History Museum in Paris. So having seen that design and heard that story, have you spotted anything? It took me a while, but I suddenly realised I have a fragment of that toile that I bought in a brocante in La Châtre last year. I was there with Marie and I fell in love with it. Again, no idea what it was. And it turns out... It's the Four Corners of the World by Ue. Here it says Amérique, and there's the beautiful feathered headdress, the man with his crocodile. He's put a stick into his mouth to hold him. A lovely monkey and stately swans in the background. I was really excited to discover where this is from. I think this is my favorite fragment. All of these twirls that I've shown you so far show the influences of interest at the time on designs, but there are two other major influences in the late 18th century that would change the designs at Jouy forever. One of them was mechanical and the other was historical. The historical one was obviously the French Revolution. Nothing could be the same after that. The world was turned upside down. And what's extraordinary is that Oberkampf, his artists, and his factory survived the revolution. Réveillon, the very famous manufacturer of wallpaper in Paris, wasn't so lucky. His factory also had a royal warrant and it was attacked by an angry mob during the revolution. The factory was completely destroyed, as was Réveillon's own home, and he and his family had to flee to England where they became émigrés. However, Oberkamp seems to have been an extraordinary diplomat above all because he survived every single regime apparently unscathed. He donated a great deal of money to the revolutionary government to make sure they knew he was on side. And before that, he'd lived very well with the court at Versailles, having his royal warrant from the king. After the revolutionary government, he continued to produce toiles under Napoleon's empire. He was very clever at changing the toiles to reflect the current thinking in the country. This toile is called Louis XVI, Restorer of Liberty, and it was produced in 1790. Louis is receiving liberty. She is the veiled figure who's being called to take an active role. She's accompanied by Mars, Minerva and Mercury and a citizen of France. Below the scene, you can see the ruins of the Bastille in a medallion. You can see that Liberty has an outstretched hand and originally this twirl showed her holding a crucifix because religion was guiding King Louis to do the right thing by bringing Liberty. But as the revolutionaries broke with the church, all of that religious symbolism was removed from this twirl and the rest was left unchanged. Oberkampf was a very clever man and he kept himself, his factory and his workers safe throughout the revolution. The other big change was mechanical because roller printing came into existence in 1797. This enabled the copper plates to be continuously applied to the fabric and that obviously sped up production enormously. But the roller plates weren't as wide as the original copper plates had been. So the loose flowing vignettes that we're used to from those early Toile de Jouis suddenly become much tighter designs. 
And I don't have time today to talk about all of those other designs that were produced at Jouy up until its closure in the mid 19th century, but I will give you a little taste as to how it changed the look of the designs. At the same time, neoclassicism was becoming very popular. Herculaneum and Pompeii had been discovered earlier in the century, and the designs found on the walls of the villas there were heavily influencing the decorative arts back in France. The idea of a new world order after the revolution also made people look back to classicism, and so all of those things started to creep more and more into Toile de Jouy. And here's a design that I think shows Ue moving towards the new style, but still keeping some of the sense of the older one. It's Diana the Huntress, and he made it in 1802. You can see Diana with her hunting dogs and her bow and arrow, and surrounding her are classical buildings that have fallen to ruin and been taken over by nature. So there's still the idea of the dominance and beauty of nature, but we're starting to go back to classicism. And you can see that the patterns are set much closer together with arabesques in between, heavily influenced by things found at Pompeii and Herculaneum. And looking beyond that to a design made in 1808, Les Monuments d'Egypte, which was again reflecting current interests because Napoleon had just conquered Egypt. You can see the tightness of the design and how regimented and orderly it is compared with those early flowing pastoral designs of the previous century. I wish I had time to go into all of those now, but sadly I am out of time today. Please let me know if you'd like to hear more about this, but also any other subject about French decorative arts that you'd like me to delve into like this in a video, let me know in the comments below and I'll try to make those in future. I'm looking for lots of ideas. Before ending, I would like to recommend the two books that I read that taught me so much about Toile de Jouy. I've ordered even more because I've become quite obsessed but I use this one very much. La Toile de Jouy, published by Citadel and Mazenot. It's a beautiful book. And Toile de Jouy by Judith Stratton. I found both of these very good reference books. Moving forward, I might not be creating videos on Fridays anymore because Michael Petrick over on Doing It Ourselves tends to post a video on a Friday and I think that that way I will have a few days each week that I can devote myself for researching an in-depth topic for Sunday, but let me know what you think about that plan. And as always on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it will be my normal Chateau Diaries of our daily life here at the Chateau de Lalande. Thank you for joining me so much and I will see you on Tuesday with the Chateau Diaries. Until then, bye-bye from Lalande. A huge thank you to all of our patrons at Lalande who are making this vlog possible, especially our Marquis and Marquises of Lalande. Alice Allen, Daniela, Dorothea B, Dan Banda, Danelle Banakovic, Jason and Valerie Best, Veronica Castillo, Sakura Dennis, Laura Demare, Dottie, Anna Farmery, Caroline Furster, Brenda Gibbons, Brenda Harris, Anthony Hindmarsh, Laura O'Keefe, Helen Jacobs, Yadeland, Jimmy Kemp, David and Summer Lalande, Shannon Maitland, Kathy Norrie, JC Award, Maureen Palmer, Bettina Rojek, Barbara Schmelzer, Sven Schreiber, Patty Suhu, Sarah Thornton, Colleen Troyer, Brand Walton, Aaron Windish, Brian Woodward, and David Young. And thank you to all of you.